Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this tea time edition, not of Doctor Who, but of who is going to be the next Director General of the BBC. Um, we saw the previous 16. Um, I'm not going to ask you to uh, uh, guess who they all are uh, or on what they have in common. Um, but um, the newest incarnation is Tim Davey, who will take up his position as Director General, the 17th Director General, in September of this year. And I think one thing everybody agrees on is that he's got a very big job to do. And so um, this afternoon, I've got a, a panel gathered around me who've got rather different views. And uh, we will also be joined on video, uh, on recording by uh, another panelist. So um, firstly, I'd like to introduce the people you can see now. Um, and that is first of all, Gillian Reynolds, who's, um, uh, may I describe you Gillian as a doyen of critics, having worked as a, a radio cri critic for quite a few years. Uh, for The Telegraph, The Guardian, and now for The Sunday Times. Not many people have worked for all those uh, papers. And um, Gillian, uh, I know you were born in Liverpool, so you're not a member of the metropolitan elite. Um, and please tell us what you think is the greatest challenge for uh, Tim Davey, in your opinion. Working with the new chairman, whoever the new right. chairman is, I think that will be a huge challenge. Well, I've got Gillian Reynolds up. And Rob Wilson. Uh, Butting in. Um, I'll just... Yes, <laughs> carry on, Gillian. So first of all, it'll be the new chairman, you know, uh, and I think that will probably be a woman. And I note with interest that Carolyn Fairburn is stepping down from um, uh, the... Uh, uh, CBI. Yeah. And yeah. And she, of course, worked for McKinsey, so she might be up there thing, but I think his immediate challenge will be to um, fill in the gaps left by uh, the lockdown in the performing arts. Now, BBC has responded pretty well. Radio has certainly responded magnificently and instantly to it, but it will take a long time to make up for what's been lost in the performing arts, particularly in music and the theatre. And I think if he has his eye to business, he will be looking at what he can do. Thank you, Gillian. Um, right, we'll hear more of that later. Um, uh, why Rob, Rod Liddell has just joined us, um, a man known for his robust views, who writes also for the Sunday Times and The Spectator, and a former editor of the Today programme, so has worked inside the Citadel for the BBC, um, uh, and has lived to tell the tale. Um, Rod, um, uh, Please tell us what you think, very briefly, is the greatest challenge for the new Director General. Well, I think it can probably be summed up as a kind of extinction rebellion. Uh, he, that's what he needs to embrace. Uh, because if you look back to February, um, the BBC was on the brink of... Uh, hovering on the brink of extinction. Uh, and what he needs to do, uh, I think, is, is two things. Firstly, capitalise on the BBC's, I think, uh, ex excellent coverage of the pandemic, uh, where it's done very well indeed, uh, and thus make the case more strongly for a centralised and all-enveloping and licence-free paying uh, broadcasting authority. But you also, more crucially and far more difficultly, uh, well, with far more difficulty, will need to address... Um, what many people believe is a grotesque bias on the part of the BBC, uh, a political bias which has its particularities, uh, particularly with Newsnight and the News and Current Affairs programmes, but it's also biased culturally as well. It needs to reconnect 
with the people who pay the bulk of its license fees, the people of Middle England? Thank you. Um, Rob Wilson, a former Conservative MP, um, uh, who lost your seat in 2017 when uh, Theresa May, remember her folks, um, called an unexpected election. Um, and, but you have taken a long-standing interest in, uh, in the BBC. Do you agree, uh, what do you think is the main challenge for um, Tim Davey? Do you agree broadly with, with what Rod's just said? Well, thank you for that uh, reminder of my past. <laughs> not, 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 necessarily, not, not exactly my favourite memory, but thanks for uh, bringing it up anyway. Um, I, th I see the BBC, like, uh, as I've said this before, but I'm just going to remind you, as a man jumping off a building, and as he passes each floor on the way down, waves to the people watching and says, so far, so good. But the BBC still has the awaits its fate of hitting the ground. And that is what Tim Davey is having to deal with at the moment. He's come in, he's got two main priorities as I see it. Firstly, he's got to wean the BBC off this long-standing strategy of being wedded to the licence fee. And secondly, he's got to introduce more diversity of opinion, a little as uh, Rob Little has said, because there is very little diversity of thought within the BBC. Um, it has more diversity of types of people in terms of ethnic minorities, women and so forth, but not enough thinking difference within the organisation. It is a very W1A style of organisation. Fine, well, we'll hear more of that later as well. And, um, uh, and now our, our last live panellist today, uh, Catherine Parsons, who... Uh, is a former uh, executive, channel executive of BBC Three, and probably the only person on this panel who speaks Japanese, I think. <laughs> Go ahead, what do you uh, think? Well, I, 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 I've tried, I'll speak in English today. Um, so, well, I believe that the biggest priority for Tim Davey is um, how to uh, counter the decrease in younger, you know, in, in the percentage of younger viewers uh, watching the BBC. Um, so I think that, you know, the priority should be increasing spend in programming that appeals to that demographic. Um, they are the audience for the next 50 years. And if they are lost, then, you know, the BBC is lost to all of us. Thank you. Um We'll come back to all of you later. Now we're going to go to um, a video recording of um, a panellist, Mark Damaser, who unfortunately cannot join us live, but who recorded this for, for us. He's a former controller of BBC Radio and uh, a strong supporter of the BBC. So uh, if, we could, if that video is available now, sit back and watch Mark. Whatever Tim Davey does, there will be uh, rows, clamour, dins and objections. Um, as the BBC approaches its centenary, uh, it's worth remembering that the BBC has been accompanied for almost each of the 98 years plus with uh, disagreements and with objections and with raucous noises off, and it won't be any different. And in some ways, Tim and the BBC should be flattered because it's when the din stops that you have to start worrying because that means that the BBC doesn't matter. And the BBC does matter, uh, partly simply functionally because everybody who pays a licence owns it and partly because it has both a historic and a contemporary huge footprint in public life. So the noise is part of the gig and that's fine. Um, the second thing is not to be put off, I think, by uh, decline. Uh, the BBC uh, has declined, uh, is declining, and will decline further. Uh, and that is not a recipe for despair. It's the inevitable function of increased competition, changing consumer habits, and changing technology. Uh, and you could simply, if you're an opponent of the BBC, rest the matter there and say, the decline means that it's no longer worth a license fee and certainly not a market intervention at this level. Uh, that would be wrong. If a Martian came down and looked at the BBC and its relationship to the public and was to be told that over 90%, significantly over 90% of the public use it every week, 
they might be mildly impressed. Um, if you then went on to say, uh, well, how much does each person use the BBC for? And the answer comes out at round about 18 hours plus a week per adult in the United Kingdom, you would be very impressed. And you're doing all of that for the sum of just a little bit over three pounds a week. So the contemporary BBC, uh, although declining, is still a massive uh, and successful force because although people are obliged to pay for it, and we'll come to that, they're not obliged to watch or listen to it or to consume it online, but they willingly do so. Not, of course, equally. So the new director general of the BBC as a whole has a huge challenge in dealing with the under 35s. Um, that is both true and also um, overwritten. Uh, it's not as if uh, the, over, the under 35s didn't consume the BBC at all. They do unquestionably consume it disproportionately less than older age groups. It was ever thus, but it's much worse and the challenge is much greater. Uh, and it's amongst the top two or three things, possibly even the single most important thing that has to be gripped and dealt with, and it's not easy. Lots of people know about it, easier to define the problem and solve it. The BBC comes lumbered with uh, a set of images um, which are unflattering and some of which are true. Uh, that is to say, it is accompanied by the rhetoric of it being a bureaucratic, sclerotic, uh, over stuffy institution that fails to adapt, lacks agility and so on and so forth. And some of that is unquestionably true and you don't need just to go to W1A to sense it. Everybody who works for the BBC, probably from the Director General downwards, has always felt at some point like they ought to be running against it. Um, so, okay, uh, the BBC has these characteristics. Are they the dominant characteristics? They're not. The dominant characteristics are that it's a place stuffed full of extremely talented people, sometimes uh, hugely argumentative, so fine. Uh, it has been, throughout its long history, been able to adapt, not always at great pace, but it has. A bit slower after the beginning of ITV in 1955, rather faster when John Burt saw the complete importance of online as a mean of, means of disseminating BBC content and so on and so forth. The BBC can adapt and it has adapted remarkably well in the round or else it wouldn't be where it is now with, as I say, this big footprint in public life. So what about the funding? Um, very few people left, I think, think that the best model is attached to some notion of a TV or even watching video online. Uh, the license fee itself uh, doesn't need to be wedded to that particular mechanism. The real debate is not about that, about whether it should still be a universal fee in which we're all obliged to pay. Uh, now that is uh, always been a, a difficult burden. Uh, for some in the public, it's a lot of money and it comes with extra responsibilities. Um, but I would argue that it is relevant to start the debate with the notion of a universal fee. So why is that? Uh, in part because the BBC uh, provides all these other goods. I mean, I think economists will call it a merit good around an informed citizenry, around education, uh, around its massive contribution to culture and the arts and the opportunities it gives for people who are supplying the BBC with programmes and ideas. And it has therefore ramifications beyond simply putting out the programs that the BBC does good in lots of ways for wider social and cultural purposes. Uh, language always seems to stick a bit, you can see why, but nevertheless I think it needs to be taken into account. But beyond that there's an economic argument which the BBC sometimes I think puts forward rather timidly which is what is the value that you get out of the amount that you pay for it. So subscription sounds like good free market economics. Why pay if you don't use, let people choose? Okay, and that's not a bad organizing principle. I don't think it's a winning argument, but it's a powerful argument. Why economically do I think it's not a great idea? It's because if you have to start dismantling the BBC and paying for it chunk by chunk, uh, it won't take long before you're paying quite a lot more for the very large bundle that the BBC currently is. No single household of the 40 million uses the BBC in the same way. For some, it might be they want Jeremy Vine and Six Music and Panorama and EastEnders and Strictly. And for a house next door, it might be Radio 3, Radio 4, uh, Panorama, David Attenborough. It doesn't matter. The point is that lots of people use it in lots of different ways. They're not all going to like everything the BBC does equally. Indeed, part of the fun of the BBC is to dislike some of the stuff that the BBC does. 
But the BBC needs to be giving enough of value, not just enough, enough of value to the tens of millions of people who constitute its audience for the three pound plus a week that it costs at the moment. Um, if you start saying to individuals within a household, well, you, you will have a subscription to BBC One because we broadly like the shows that they do broadly and we like BBC News and Current Affairs and we like a bit of Five Live and we like a bit of Six Music and we like CBeebies. Uh, it won't take you long before you're paying far more than three pounds a week for it. So there are huge economies of scale which you need to trade off when you think about the future of the BBC against the notion that it's a compulsory and big market intervention. I remain completely on the side of the view that it represents still a fantastic bargain uh, and that the evidence of that is still the usage, above all the usage, and that when you ask people to live without the BBC, an experiment was done a few years back, it's not so straightforward. Uh, where do I think the main challenges are apart from the under 35s uh, and the license fee? I would say above all talent, talent, talent. The one reason why the BBC has succeeded, largely succeeded um, in the near 100 years is because it's been a magnet for talent. Uh, and it has enough critical mass in each of the areas where it's trying to serve the public to get people to do tremendous work, uh, not always uh, at the highest rate of pay, I might add. And sometimes a lot of people that are working for the BBC are working for less money than they would do if they were working elsewhere. But the BBC's values of creativity, innovation, sheer decency, often, often imperfectly executed, but there are lots of really decent people in the best sense of the word liberal minded working for the BBC. They've come and done that and the BBC has been a magnet for talent and it's been a talent cluster and it produces outstanding programs and that is really the secret of it. If you don't have enough talented people doing it, whatever it is, it doesn't work. One brief word about news and current affairs. I suffer from confirmation bias as I think do others on the panel in different directions. I'm more likely to think of the BBC as being a successful impartial broadcaster flawed unquestionably flawed, um, but nevertheless, largely impartial, fair and dispassionate in evidence-based journalism and judgment than others. I realize that and I sometimes grind my teeth when I hear things which I think breach the BBC's impartiality. And it's bad when it happens and it's bound to happen. But I think the BBC largely succeeds and should be respected for it. So the final thought is that when the adults go into the room to sort out the BBC's future, both the size of the license fee and the funding mechanism, it's as well not to think of the BBC simply as an accretion of its historical excellence and that the decline is so inevitable that you know, the game is more or less up and will simply manage the decline. It's better to see it as a huge and successful contemporary institution full of pitfalls, full of difficulties, accompanied by the bang and the clamour, but enormously good in many ways and to be valued. And when it comes to settling its future, that's what should be in people's heads. Right, well, plenty to chew on there, but I expect, um, uh, Rod, you were perhaps choking at the end of that when um, Mark was saying that largely the BBC News was impartial. Um, it was the thing you picked out as being um, uh, the new Director General's uh, chief task. Why would a man who has not any journalistic experience and who is known for his, perhaps his commercial acumen, why is he the right person to deal with what you said was the biggest issue, impartiality, and how should he go about it? Uh, I have no idea uh, as to why Tim Davey is the best person. I could think of many other people who would be very good director generals. Andrew Neil, for example, I think would be a very good director general of the BBC, but he probably wouldn't do it. I, I think there's a couple of things. I mean, I'm used to Mark's perorations from meetings within the BBC, uh, and I fear that he is gripped uh, uh, captured by what we might call institutional complacency uh, or structural complacency. Um, but there are good things for the BBC. Let me start with those. If you think back to February uh, of this year, uh, January and February of this year, the BBC um, had a sword over its head. Um, 
the uh, it was in the crosshairs of a government which mistrusted it for two main reasons. The first reason being that as free marketeers, they did not see the case uh, in the current commercial world for a, um, uh, a centrally funded uh, broadcasting organisation. It seemed to them an anachronism and an affront to free market economics. Um, and secondly, they also had grave reservations about its proven continual and relentless bias. Let's take the first one first. COVID has, to a degree, come to the rescue of the BBC. Uh, and it's quite interesting, uh, the way in which it's done so. Um, Newsnight accepted, uh, and it really is accepted, I think the BBC has had a very good pandemic, uh, particularly on Radio 4, but also on Radio 5, uh, and also, to a degree, on Radio 2. I think it has, COVID has kind of played to the strengths of the BBC and the things we always liked about it, which was that ability to bring the country together, um, the, the, the ability to rise above the political fray and to say this is something which bothers all of us. Uh, and I think the BBC has done a fairly good job, Newsnight accepted, uh, in, in bringing the country together in that way. And I don't think that's a small point. Events such as COVID can change mindsets. And the mindset at the moment, and the mindset which has been growing and growing and growing, is that a centrally funded broadcaster is an anachronism and should be got rid of. Um, but events can change that mindset. If you think back to 2008, uh, prior to 2008, the issue of nationalisation, uh, of which I've always been a fan, uh, was nowhere on the agenda. Nobody had nationalisation on their agenda. It took the financial crisis of 2008 to suddenly make people see that actually there is some case for big government intervention. Uh, as soon as George Bush nationalised the banks, for example, we suddenly saw, oh, OK, nationalisation isn't just something these lefties do. Nationalisation could be quite useful. Similarly, I think with COVID, I think people will think again. And I think this is an enormous bonus for Tim Davey as he comes into the job, that actually there is, a, uh, there is something rather worthwhile, rather wonderful about having a centrally based broadcasting organisation which, which we all fund together, a sense of togetherness, which was always one of the things we talked about during COVID. Uh, and I think the BBC has stepped up to the plate and done it rather well. The problems, two problems, uh, which Davey faces, and I think are almost in some ways, uh, well, the first problem is almost insuperable. I don't know how he deals with this, which is what Rob alluded to um, uh, without question, um, which is the BBC's relentless, continual, proven bias on political and cultural issues. It, and the problem is there are the particularities we're talking in a week in which the BBC, having escaped from lockdown briefly, decided that the BLM protests were clearly the best thing that's ever happened uh, to this country for a very long time, uh, and doctored photographs so that they didn't show the violence of the protests and put misleading headlines up, which were they, they were later forced to rewrite. I mean... <laughs> I could, when, when I was told that they doctored photographs, I didn't believe it. But I argued with people. I said the BBC wouldn't do that, but they did. And it follows from the Emily Maitlis Farago. It follows from a time post-Brexit where the BBC was relentlessly biased against the Brexit cause, as it was actually, you know, in the years from 2000 to 2016. Um, and there are statistics to prove all this. We have all the detail. We have all the, 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 the worries from the people who have left the BBC, the Paxmans, John Sargent, um, lots and lots of people who have left the BBC who, who say, much as Rob said, and this is where Rob is right and where Tim Davey has his biggest problem, that while the BBC has done an excellent job in diversifying the racial and ethnic background of BBC staff. When I first joined the BBC in 1988, uh, you had to go to the top floor of Broadcasting House before you found any black faces, and that's where the canteen was. 
you know, it is wonderful that the BBC has addressed that. What it has failed to do utterly and totally is have diversity of opinion. There is none. And that, I think, has been the problem, to take the most recent example of Newsnight, that there was no one in that Newsnight meeting to say, hang on a minute, maybe Dominic Cummings was right. Maybe he was justified. There was no one in that Newsnight meeting to say, or in the Today programme, or in the World of One, to say, hang on, um, hasn't the government actually got this right? There, there, there is no... These are the particularities of it as we relate to news and current affairs. There I'm, is... going to, I'm going to put a time warning on you now, Rod. I think. Okay, you know, my last point. Uh, those are the. Um, I'm, I'm also going to say at this point is that there's no one here on this panel to who's speaking on behalf of the BBC or BBC News, and therefore I've got no one to ask about that doctored photos uh, or doctored film. I have a look in the press. Said. It's all in the press. It's all in the press. It's you can um, see it everywhere. They cropped no, no, a photo. I saw, you know, I saw, it, the, Gillian, it, I saw it, the Gillian. Gillian it was is obviously. Can I just say one more coming. thing? Just it's just one more thing. Those are the particularities. The particularities of political bias, but there's also a cultural bias, which is the stuff which affects the rest of the network, the dramas, the comedies. Um, uh, the the, the non-political documentaries. There is an inherent bias there as well, a cultural bias. And in many senses, I agree with that bias. You know, I'm, 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 I'm with them. But it, it, it is a lack of diversity in the workforce, which is the problem. And okay. it, I hope we can... Okay, well, um, I'm going to... Hand the mic now to uh, to Gillian because I can see you were raring to come in at various stages there. Can Gillian go go on? You have the floor. Oh, we've lost your we've lost your mic. She's on mute. She's on mute. She's on mute. Unmute your microphone, Gillian. <laughs> unmute your microphone. Uh, do, you want, do you want to come to someone else? Kathleen yes, I think so. Yes, we can't hear you, Gillian. Um, while someone hopefully uh, can text Gillian to say, unmute your microphone. Um, I'm I think she going has to... tried to unmute her microphone, but it's not unmuting for her. Oh, uh, no. Uh, that's, I don't know what's happening there. No, there's still the microphone still off. Um, Rob, um, although I know you, you share uh, the same views on at least the diversity of opinion, um, are you as comfortable as Rod appears to be now that the BBC has saved itself because mm. of the COVID crisis and that the case for public service broadcasting is now firmly made for another 10, 15 years or more? <laughs> No, and I think uh, Rod's guilty in, in the first part of what he said of, of, of waving as he falls past the windows, but the ground is always there because the ground is the financial predicament the BBC is always going to face. While other organisations are passing by it, um, and that's part of the whole decline argument, um, it, hasn't, it hasn't really got its act together to, to meet the challenges that it ha has to face in the next 10, 20 years. It's, the media industry moves by it. So despite the fact that I would agree the BBC's had a reasonable uh, COVID-19 crisis, I still don't think it's in tune with the public uh, across the country. And that's where it needs to be. It needs to be reflecting. It needs to be in tune with them. And it, and it, and it hasn't been for a long time now. I think... Uh, Rod referred to the Brexit debate, which tends to underline a lot of the problems the BBC face, faces in that it was totally out of touch with what the country was thinking. Yeah. And it's yeah. not the first, the first time that this has been the case. And it goes to the heart of what Tim Davey, and I've said this to Tim Davey already, I've I said to him the other day that what he needs point of view, that aren't just going to nod their head and say, oh yeah, that's great. 
And the trouble with the BBC is it's got too many people who all think in the same way, who all have a cultural bias that yeah. is this metropolitan elite bias that so many people <laughs> refer to. And it's very <laughs> London-centric still, as like the fact that it, it's longer in the region. So there is that. But the other I thing Jim David um, really yeah. needs to do is he needs to bring... Uh, sorry. I was going to say, one of the other things he needs to do is he, and the reason why I think he's a good appointment, and I believe he's a pretty talented uh, guy, he's got great ability and he's got a lot of know-how on the commercial side. And I think he's exactly the right person the BBC needs at the moment if he does, if he uses that experience to lead the organisation into a new environment. And that new environment, environment must include a change in the way the license fee is um, delivered. In that, it needs to be much smaller and they need to make much more commercial use of what they've got and what they can develop. Um, I think as um, the speak, speak had uh, recorded said, they've got a lot of talent within the organization. And I agree with that. There's an awful lot of talent within the BBC. They just need to use it, exploit it in the way that other media and other broadcasters do. So the two points, just to summarise, Tim Davey needs to do, he needs to use his commercial leadership skills and he needs to get more diversity and challenge into the organisation in a way that just isn't there at the moment. Right, thank you. We're still trying to get um, get Gillian back. I've just sent a message to her, so I hope she uh, receives that, that we cannot hear you, Gillian. Um, Rob, going back to what you, uh, uh, what you just said, um, surely the, the BBC has put an awful lot of investment in the last few years into new centres in Salford, Glasgow, um, uh, obviously Cardiff. There's lots more out of, uh, out of London production than there was. Um, there's also um, uh, the whole network of local radio and regional television, which very few other media organizations in the country can rival. So why is it you say, actually, they all think alike uh, when they're based in different parts of the country? <laughs> I, I think you'll find the BBC DNA in the way that uh, the type of people that it recruits and the type of view that they have, it runs with the organization wherever they're situated and the, the culture that is there is absorbed by the people that it takes on by and large with, with with some honorable exceptions and that's the problem once they get in the organization and and, and it's a little bit like the nhs because the nhs has a similar cultural problem that uh, certainly in the management side of things once people get in the, the into the culture of the organization they accept it, they absorb, they absorb it, and then they, they just continually repeat it as if they're a virus repeating it across the organisation. And that doesn't do it any, any good. They've got to get more people with a range of different views and a range of different challenges into the organisation ur urgently. People that are going to tell them when they're wrong, when there's, you know, that will stand up for a different view across a whole range of different important issues for the British public. And that needs to be done sooner rather than later because the British public are, despite the COVID-19 successes that the BBC has, they're separating gradually away from it. Yes. And they can see yes. all the problems. They can see, they can yes. see it's like a slow motion car crash in front of them. And the BBC can't see it, but everybody else almost can. Can I, can I just come in very quickly? The BBC can't see it because it thinks it's right. That's the problem. It is that confirmation bias, you know, and 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 it's 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 frightening in a way because they are buttressed by the opinions of all the people they work with, and they are then buttressed again by the opinions on Twitter, which they take to be truth, and it's not, it's not, it's a real real problem. And the last general election, which must have come as an, an enormous shock to the BBC, showed that. That the, the, the public isn't as convinced about the importance of identity politics, for example, as the rest of the country. It wasn't just about Brexit. It wasn't just about the uselessness of Corbyn. It was about a move away from that cultural 
mindset which the BBC and the Labour Party and parts of the Conservative Party sign up to. You know, it, 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 it's a, as he says, it's a slow motion car crash. Well, um, uh, you obviously, two of the panelists clearly agree on that point. Catherine, I'm going to go to you now. And I know you want to concentrate on the, the young audience. Tell us what you think from your experience at BBC Three. Uh, what do you think is um, the, that Tim Daly should be doing to bring back those uh, those young people wherever they live in the country? Uh, how do you get them back to the BBC, Catherine? Uh, well, I mean, I think that when I worked at BBC Three, it was right at the beginning. I worked there 2004 to 2006. And, you know, the budget was much higher for BBC Three then than it is now. It's at, They're increasing the budget for BBC Three, but that is still lower than it was, was back in 2004. So I think, uh, you know, a far greater spend needs to be made on programming that appeals to young people. Now, as Mark alluded to in his piece, um, attracting younger audiences is a major challenge. There's a lot of competition. Um, but if you think that, that BBC Three uh, gets only 10% of the budget of BBC Two and less than 4% of the budget of BBC One, you do start to <laughs> understand why perhaps um, the BBC has problems attracting younger viewers. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, I actually think that, that BBC Three has done an amazing job considering how much money it has to spend in comparison with, the, you know, Netflix and Amazon. They win a tremendous number of awards. Um, and, you know, just looking at the, the reaction to their drama, Normal People, that's been successful all over the world. But... Um, I'm not here saying that that group, the group under 35 in 2020 are the most important thing in Great <laughs> um, what I'm, my, What I'm saying is that they are the viewers for the next 50 years. And if the BBC mm, fails no. to hold on to them, they will be gone forever. They're not going to come back when they're middle-aged. And if the BBC is lost, mm. we no, will no, leave no, no. Part of our national identity. Um, okay. It feeds into it. Fe it feeds into it, a creative ecosystem, which um, and I, you've alluded to the fact that I uh, I've worked a lot overseas, and I can tell you that you know having had that experience, it's made me appreciate um, the kind of creative venture capital that the BBC offers for this country. Right, thank you. I think Gillian is putting her thumb up. I think at last, yes, the, you're unmuted. Gillian, I'm really sorry about that. I, 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 Don't worry. But um, Gillian, I think you can hear everything that's been said. And I've been seeing you getting very animated from time to time. So um, come on, you've got the floor now. Say what you would like to. <laughs> well, if I wasn't white already, it would have turned a brighter shade of white. Uh, listening to all that rubbish from Rob and uh, Rod. I mean, the, the, the bias you speak of is your bias, not mine. Uh, I, I feel views I don't agree with, but I don't think the BBC editorialises, even innately, to the extent that you see. I mean, listen to the commercial stations to, uh, who aren't, of course, obliged to be unbiased. The BBC has faults, certainly. But I just want to say two particular things. The BBC after the Queen is the BB is Britain's best known international brand. I mean, Catherine will know this. She's worked abroad a lot. You'll all know this. If, you, if you're if standing in the street and someone says, where are you from? And you say, I'm from England. And they say, oh, the BBC. It's not a failing brand. It, the BBC World Service is the world's most successful international broadcaster, without a doubt. Um, we have a system like no other in the world. It's historic, it's old fashioned, but it has inbuilt merits because we own it. And we forget that. We forget that we own the BBC. We are the shareholders. And if we don't like Where it. Where are my shares? 
Lipitor licensing deal, their shares. Um, uh, by the way, uh, how much is, is the license fee, Rob? Sorry? So how, how much is the license fee? Don't you know? Yes, I know. Do you? Yes. I think but, it's I'm just off the top of my head, and I pay it by standing uh, order or direct debit. I think I pay about £12 or so a month, £12 something. Yes, it's 100 yeah. £150. Yeah. I didn't see your point, Gillian. Well, I'm reinforcing Mark Damas's point. It's cheap at price. You get things from the BBC. Yes, it is. You couldn't buy anywhere. But let me just... Can I, can I just say, I use the toilet 100% every day and it costs me about £3 as well in terms of the drainage and sewerage and water fees. But, you know, that doesn't mean well, it's good. <laughs> Much. I feel deeply enlightened. Um, and I want to also correct a certain thing that's been creeping in here about the BBC not serving young audiences. Um, every kind of music, not just orchestral music, not just radio three music, every kind of music. How do I know this? Because my youngest son manages DJs, not DJs on the radio, the kind of work in clubs. And, you know, the popularity of the range of music at the BBC is unparalleled. I cannot find another radio. Oh, it's excellent. Gillian. Rob Little has had the trumpet for hours, and I've been sitting here. Yes, uh, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going to. I was to just agreeing with you, Gillian. Calm down, love. Gillian. Gillian um, I want you to, to go back to what you were talking about at the beginning about um, uh, about arts programming yeah. and culture, because Mark alluded to that as well, the cultural role of the, of the BBC. How do you think Tim Davey should approach that? Because again, he's not got an experience in programming, um, but how, so how do you encourage that? Yeah, no. You're mm -hmm. absolutely wrong, and let me tell you why. Uh, Tim Davey, um, has a bad effect on people when they first meet him because they think, oh, he's a little geezer, or he's a little know-it-all. I've watched him since he came into the BBC and before. Everybody who wrote him up last weekend said, oh, he worked for Pepsi, as if that was a bad thing. When he was at Pepsi, he backed the first syndicated show on commercial radio, the Pepsi chart show, their first big success. When he came to the BBC, it was in marketing. Oh, marketing, people said. They all turned their noses up. When he came to radio, my nose was turned up. I thought, who's he? He's only been at Pepsi and he's only been in marketing. And I watched him as he learned radio. He's a listener. He's really, really clever. He listens, he watches, he waits, he absorbs. And he, he set to to learn radio. And when George Entwistle suddenly had to resign, uh, you will all remember that awful uh, weekend. Tim had to pick up the ball and run with it. And I was chairing a conference where George was set to speak. And Tim had to come in, white-faced and trembling, and face the music. And he did it brilliantly because he's, he has experience of making money. He has experience of listening to people. He has experience of knowing how to make things work. And since he went to the studios, they've made money. If the, this year's um, annual report isn't out yet. Last year's annual report says he made more money for BBC Studios than has ever been made. I think it was 240 something million. He's had big offers while he, while he was uh, working for studios, but he stayed, and I'm glad that he stayed because he's probably the only one on that parade of um, uh, DGs that we've had who in the last half century has actually learned the fabric of the corporation. He knows where its weaknesses are, he knows where its strengths are. And I think, this is my final point, that he has a secret weapon. He has BBC local radio. Now, everybody turns their nose up at BBC local radio. No DG so far has realized the potential power of each of those stations. When they were gathered into the mighty empire of BBC News a few years ago, they lost all their individuality. Yet in times of crisis, 
whether it's foot and mouth, whether it's floods or strikes or COVID. It's to BBC local stations that people turn, possibly maybe an older audience at the moment. But I see mothers, uh, uh, the, um, my youngest uh, grandchildren go to school where I talk to them, the mothers sometimes outside, and everybody listens to the local radio to see when the schools were opening. And that was before, all of that was before commercial radio started closing down their newsrooms. Bauer closed 49 commercial radio station AM newsrooms because they can't afford it anymore. Now, as you'll see from the last general election, what happens in local politics, and Rob will know this better than anyone, has national consequences. And it will have again come to the next election. I think Tim Davy, being a serious marathon runner, will stick this through to the end. He's a SWAT too, so we know what to do. And he's a businessman. He's the right man in the right job. I have great hopes for him. I do agree with some of the things that are, uh, some of the criticisms he's made. But I do think also that um, we devalue the BBC at our peril. It's a bargain. It's a bargain. Well, thank you, Gillian. I'm glad you were able to join us. I'm going to, at this stage, um, put uh, one or two of the questions that I've received to the panel. Any of you indicate if you want to respond to this. So I've had a question from Christian Aurora. Are there any other public broadcasters in the rest of the world that the panel thinks are doing a better job or have a better model than the license fee funded BBC? Who would like to take that on? Well, Gillian? Gillian? What the models? American Public Radio is financed largely by a subscription. And every year they have these great contests, you know, with not contests, those nights, fundraising nights. They've made a lot of money out of the, the great revolutionary podcast serial, but that's what kind of spun off into its own business now. I uh, suppose. People who have public, broad, public uh, broadcasters like um, Italy and Germany and France and so on, and, and Ireland no longer have them to the same degree that we have. And I think um, the mod there is no direct comparison. I don't think, I stand to be corrected, that there is another one quite like the BBC. There's, right. the, Finnish, there's the Finnish Public Broadcasting Corporation, mm -hmm. which actually, or certainly did until recently, and may still do, uh, reads the news in Latin uh, of an evening. Uh, <laughs> which I think is wonderful. I, think that's uh, I, I met the guy who did it. <laughs> which, but I think Julian's right. Uh, if I could just take issue with one point, a point made by Mark, um, but also the main point of Catherine's argument, which is this need to reach out to the 35-year-olds. Well, I was always told that when I was editor of the Today programme, that you've got to reach a younger audience. Otherwise, your audience will wither and die. Uh, and I think the editor of the Daily Telegraph over the years has always been asked, uh, has always been warned that, that your, that your average readership is 69 years old and, and they're going to die very soon. Uh, you, it's not quite like that. I think there's two problems there. The first is the... By and large, okay, young people don't listen to the BBC as much as they used to. And as Mark Danner has said, it was ever thus that they never used to, really. What happens is that they come to the BBC later, mm. exactly as they come to the Daily Telegraph and exactly as they came to the Today programme when I was working for it. You would finally find that they would reach the age of 40 and think, I wonder what's on the Today programme today. I think, I, so the other problem with prioritising the 35-year-old, the, the under 35s, is that it plays into an enhancement of, the, of what I would see as the BBC's cultural bias, uh, which puts a lot of people off elsewhere in the country. Um, so I, 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 just, I just say that as a warning that, you know, um, this this... Attempt to capture youth uh, is uh, might be chimeric. <laughs> well, Catherine, I, I, I think you should answer that one. Why? 
why do you think um, BBC Three is necessary then? And uh, why are you so worried about um, the loss of the audience, the young audience? I mean, I, I think that, you know, the broadcasting environment is completely different to when I started working in television. I mean, I, I, am, I am actually not in the BBC Three demographic, as you can tell. Um, there is much more competition now. Uh, I mean, I don't disagree what, with what Rod is saying, if you shift back 20 odd years, but now I think that there is a real danger that if young people don't get enough of what they want on the BBC, they are going to be, I mean, they're all, you know, if you look at the figures, they're already watching, you know, huge amounts on Netflix and Amazon. Uh, I don't think it's comparable. And, um, you know, uh, just rewinding, I'll just jump in and say, obviously, um, the Japanese uh, have a public broadcaster, which is very, very similar to the BBC, and also is in a similar way feeds into the kind of creative culture of, of Japan and they have a license fee so they have the same model so and is, um, there, a, is there a debate there about the sustainability there's no there's no debate uh, the, the it, it because of a different culture in Japan people they it, 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 you don't have to pay the license fee but fee but everybody does because culturally that's what people do they they're not forced to do it by law they just do it um but in it, the actual model is the same and it's very it's very important part of of their creative economy um yeah and it, so, well. so rob what international model do you uh favor well, the one we have Oh, I'm sorry, Rob. Oh, yes, yes. Sorry. I'd say that the, the, the first thing uh, I say is that we're in danger of doing what uh, we've done for so long about the NHS, which is uh, eulogising it. And uh, the NHS, by any comparison around Europe or around the world, is not as world class as we like to think it is. No. Uh, that's not to say lots of people in the NHS don't work really hard and do amazing things. It's just that if you compare you know, disease rates in Germany and France and so forth, uh, they do a much better job in, in curing people's illnesses. And the, the danger we've got here is we're, we're talking about the BBC as if it's, uh, again, uh, an organisation that is, is beyond any sort of reproach or any criticism. And of course it isn't. And I leave international comparisons to people that know a lot more about what's going on in each individual country around the world. All I know is the British model cannot, cannot stand up to scrutiny and cannot be a long-term solution to broadcasting uh, in this country simply because the commercial realities uh, are going to hit the BBC smack in the face in the next five to ten years without any shadow of a doubt. You have massive uh, competitors moving into the space where the BBC is occupying. If you think... There's a cat in hell's chance the BBC making inroads into the youth market. You're very mistaken. There are so that big money is chasing that market in the way that the BBC will never be able to sustain on the licence fee. So it's just, it, it's all pie in the sky stuff that just is meaningless in the real world uh, of commerce and, and, and the leadership that Tim Davey needs to bring to the BBC. You haven't actually said, Rob, what if the licence fee, if you think that's a dead model or dying model, what you think a new model would be? Or whether you're talking about doing away with the BBC and just letting it float free uh, um, as a commercial entity. Just tell us a little bit more. I, I what, mean, what the thing about the BBC, the thing about the BBC is it, it's grown and grown and mushroomed o over the decades. And really what it needs to do is it needs to retreat to a, a core of things that in terms of, a, in terms of the public paying, it needs to retreat to a core of things that it, that it can you know, do well uh, and do properly. And I think there's a, there is an argument to be made for some things to be paid for by a taxpayer or through the license fee. And I think that's a small amount of money, not, not the 150 odd pounds that it is now. So I, I see a declining role for the license fee as a part of a small core um, funded part of the BBC, but I see a much bigger role 
for the commercial side of the BBC and the, the programme making and the box sets and all that side of the BBC. So there is, there is a hybrid organisation that the BBC can become, but the hybrid side is more to the commercial competitive side of the organisation rather than to this massive forced licence fee side that we have now. Okay, um, and uh, Rod, you've obviously, you seem to have been brought on the idea of, of, um, uh, of nationalisation and public service broadcasting you've talked about earlier. Uh, are you favouring a subscription model of some sort in the future, or do you think the licence fee should get smaller? What do you think is the, the, uh, the, the best way forward for Tim to go? I think it depends very much on whether Tim Davy can address the issues. And I know Gillian dismissed them and Mark dismissed them, but I'm sorry, but they're documented. And it's a real, real problem that the BBC is drifting away from the cultural values and mores of the people who pay for it. Uh, I mean, that, 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 that is documented. It's beyond, it's beyond argument, I would have thought. However, I disagree with Rob on a number of counts. Um, if his prognosis is correct, then British people would be making an irrational choice. Because as Damaza um, said, and Gillian has said, the BBC is extraordinarily good value for money. There is no question about that. It, is, it would be on the part of us, if we were looking, much as Damaza suggested, uh, how are we going to get our entertainment... What was, was that? Trumpets for me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, that, that was my phone uh, telling me <laughs> the sorry, the is uh, again. Apologies for that, folks. No, no. I, I think I think it would be an irrational decision on our part if we were to scrap the license fee because it is clearly very good value for money. But it's yeah. only good value for money if the BBC abides by its charter abides by its ethos and does reflect the values of middle england Gillian, rather uh, than Gillian, i must go back to you and ask do you do you accept as uh, someone born in liverpool do you ex do you think that um, there is a uh, cultural bias in in the bbc particularly in uh, in obviously what you you hear, not just news and current affairs. When Rod said it's across everything, it's across documentaries, it's across everything. Do, do, do you I, agree? I accept to a certain extent what um, Rod has said about um, a certain air of uh, condescension creeping into people's voices when they talk, you know, when they talk about doing this and doing that, and it annoys me greatly when the Today program says. Now we are going to Liverpool and we are going to yes. and we're going to yes. and, Oh yes, hello. Let's if there's a story there, report the bloody story, but don't go there and pretend to virtue. That really annoys me. I do want to make one point though. Um, when um, Mark Damazel was talking about uh, people who've made dynamic change, he, he singled out John Birch and John Birch did make dynamic change. But I want to remind you all, some of you probably all know, but let me remind you, that he was working with a chairman he knew and got on with, Christopher Bland. They worked together at LWT. Mm -hmm. They saw things in harmony. Bland backed him when Burke wanted to digitize, went straight into the digital revolution, which was a great thing to do. No, I didn't do it at the time, but I you know, asked my children. I don't often see things at the time. But you can see yeah. things later. So that's why I think the appointment of the chairman is going to be absolutely crucial in which whatever form the BBC evolves into and whatever Tim Davies' role in that will be. But um, I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist. Thank you. Um, one last word from anybody before we wind it up, because I think everybody's. Uh, made all their points, not seeing anybody raring to go. Um, the most important thing uh, to say is to thank all the panel for this afternoon, but also I'd like to say that the reason this event has been organized is that there is a book 
but uh, you can all find uh, at sales at bitesizebooks.com. Is the BBC still in peril? You can also find it on Amazon, but there is a special price just for today of five pounds. So go out and get it now and um, at sales at bitesizedbooks.com. Um, there's lots of contributions in there from uh, some from people who are on the panel today there's, um, and some uh, from many others who have got interesting things to say. So um, please look for that. Is the BBC still in peril? And I think we have probably not quite answered that question today, but the question today was really, what's the challenge for the new DG? So uh, uh, good luck to uh, Tim Davey, who starts in September. Thank you to Gillian Reynolds, to Catherine Parsons, to Rob Wilson, Rod Liddell, and thank you to all of you who have been listening to this and watching this debate today. And sorry for the technical problems. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.